Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Dialogue and Debate with Cumberland Lodge. I'm very sorry that I can't actually welcome you at the Lodge this morning, but in the circumstances, you'll understand that. I'm Jane Furness, a, a trustee of Cumberland Lodge, and I've worked in the world of crime and justice all my career, and for several years was the chief exec of the Independent Police Complaints Commission. I'm delighted to be chairing this webinar this morning. It's the third in a series of four that Cumberland Lodge has organized, focusing on issues of race and justice in policing, education, the culture sector, and in wider society. The first two webinars took place last week. And in case you missed them, you can catch up um, as the recordings are available on our website on the Read, Watch, Listen page. The opening we webinar on Wednesday last week focused on race and justice and on our report um, produced by Cumberland Lodge on race in Britain, inequality, identity and belonging. And our panellists discussed the Black Lives Matter movement and how it has triggered our broader debate on structural inequalities and racial discrimination. On Thursday's webinar, our report, Difficult Histories and Positive identities was the focus and our panelists discussed how to deal with difficult British histories in particular how they are ta taught and represented in education museums and public spaces today we're going to explore how the police and civil society can respond to the distress and anger caused by racial discrimination and how we can bring people together and improve social cohesion for those interested, our report, Resilient Communities, is relevant to today's webinar. And along with the other reports I've already mentioned, it can be found on our website. The death of George Floyd in the US sparked demonstrations and expressions of anger directed at the police here in the UK. And as an education charity devoted to bringing people together to discuss difficult issues, Cumberland Lodge wanted to provide an opportunity at this crucial moment for a discussion. So at this point, I'd like to welcome our guest panellists. First, we have Dr. Alison Hedari, who's a commander in the Metropolitan Police Service. Leroy Logan, who's the chair of trustees at Voyage Youth and is a former superintendent in the Metropolitan Police. Dr. Rosemary Mallet, who is the Archdeacon of Croydon, and Hashi Muhammad, a barrister at Number Five Chambers and an author and broadcaster. So for those of you watching this morning, do please get involved, submit questions you'd like to put to our guests as we go along. You can submit them via the Q&A function if you're watching live on Zoom or by tweeting at Cumberland Lodge or commenting on our Facebook live stream. We'd encourage you to ask some questions and we'll take as many as we can. So just to get us started, what I wanted to do was just state a few facts about racial disparity in the criminal justice system, which is well documented. So if you're young, male and BAME, and in the same situation as a young male white person, you are more likely to be stopped and searched, more likely to be arrested, more likely to be charged, more likely to be denied bail or, or remand, and remanded in custody, more likely when it comes to trial to be convicted of a crime, more likely to be sent to custody or imprisonment. And you're less likely to get a place on a prison rehabilitation course once you are in prison you're less likely to get parole or early release. You're less likely to be supported to rehabilitate. So you're not surprisingly, you're more likely to reoffend, And tragically, you're more likely to die in custody. And just to give you a couple of stats to support those statements, which are well documented. In 2018-19 calendar year, financial year, um, four out of every thousand white people were stopped and searched by the police, whereas it was 38 out of every thousand black persons. And as a white person, more, many more white people die in police custody, many more. But, as a, but black people are less than 3% of the population, and yet 8% of those who die in custody. 
these are really important and impactful stats on what happens. And I'd just like to start by asking each of our panel members to say very briefly, literally in a sentence or two, how those that information strikes them. Alison, could I start with you as a commander in the Met? So uh, there's two dimensions uh, for me, actually, as a commander in the Met, but also um, I was born and brought up in London. Um, and um, the first thing that strikes me, actually, just as a human being, is that those statistics are very sad. Uh, and that there is, um, although from a policing perspective, I think that we've actually come a long way in the last few years in terms of our um, scrutiny um, and the scrutiny processes that we have in place, especially around stop and search and use of force, and that work is ongoing. Actually, there is more th that we need to do, not just in policing, but with also partners and communities to open up a dialogue around what this means for communities and to be on the receiving end of some perhaps harsh truths, but actually to make sure that we are able to really listen. So not only talk to communities, but listen to communities about the impact and continue to make progress. We have made progress, but we have some way to go. Thanks, Alison. That takes us probably nicely to Rosemary um, for her reaction. Rosemary, your reaction to my comments. Although you know these statistics, as you hear them read out to you, the feeling is just one of deep pain. Typically, I start first as a black person because that's the first thing you see about me. So this is my community. These are my people. These are the young people often that I have spent time with, have helped to grow and want them to be the best they can be and to hear that this is the way in which their lives are going to be impacted by what for me feels like the toxicity of racism in the institution that should be there to protect them, but actually is part of the problem of their lives and being able to live their lives in the best way possible. It just pains me. Thank you, Rosemary. We'll come back to you and what might be done about the pain in a moment or two. Um, Leroy, would you like to comment on your reaction to the to the stats? Sorry, unmute myself. Very, very sad to hear this because this just reminds me of a pre-McPherson era, which has been laid bare by COVID and Black Lives Matters. The whole look and feel of policing seems to be heavily influenced by certain emboldened officers who believe their conscious bias and their prejudice with power, which leads to racism, seems to play itself out in the streets especially for black men who are feared, I think to some extent, un misunderstood. And I say that because the first 10 years of the McPherson report, there was independent oversight through the Stephen Lawrence Steering Group chaired by Jack Straw, holding chief constables to account in the rollout of the recommendations. And it was effective because what gets measured gets done. The second half of those ten, uh, of 20 years, so the last 10 years, has been a litany of accountability due to the dissolving of the Stephen Lawrence Steering Group, count, compounded by austerity and the reduction in community policing. And then this right wing pushback within the rank and file of the police service on the recommendations. And there I said, the Brexit factor, which again, we saw an increase in hate crime in the wider public. And we saw a hardening of attitudes in the police service. And I've seen that not only doing internal um, work within the Met, 
when I was doing anti-gang work, but also I've seen it with Voyage Youth, my charity been running for almost 20 years, where they believe they're over-policed and under-protected. And that has been a constant dialogue, especially in the last 10 years. I'd really like to come back to some of that, uh, those points in a few minutes, um, Leroy, really helpful comments. And Hashi, how, how did you respond to the points I made, which I know will be very familiar to you? Yes, I mean, I think the statistics um, are very shocking and they speak to um, some of the points that, that were being already raised, both in terms of what it feels like to be a young black male walking around uh, in Britain today and the disproportionality of these factors. And it also speaks to the points that are being made in relation to how a black man is viewed in society, feared, uh, mistreated, uh, but also it is true to acknowledge the fact that uh, a lot of young black males are also the victims of crime in many places, especially in, in a city, London. And they are the victims of crime in which the perpetrators of that crime are disproportionately other young black males. Mm. And so there is a both a societal factor in this, but also a demonizing factor. And that's why I think I hope we can discuss some more in relation to the gaps that need to be bridged both by community policing, but also people in the community who need to raise these issues in a way that brings, this, brings people together. And the final thing I'd say is that we still have to work with the police. The police still have to work within our communities. And our communities are not going to be getting to a place where there are no more black males living in it. And so if this disproportionality this is borne out as we see through the statistics, everyone has to come up with a solution on the table. There's no point in sort of splitting hairs as to what the numbers mean or indeed who's to blame for it, but we do need an, we, need, we do need answers. And those answers have to come from every direction. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for that. And just a quick reminder for those of you listening, do feel able to um, post your questions um, on the Q&A function um, and we'll take as many as we can during the event. Um, so, um, could, Leroy, can I come back to you first? What I'd like to do is ask each of you some questions over the next half an hour or so. And Leroy, I'm particularly interested, and you may feel able to comment on this um, from your previous uh, role in the Metropolitan Police and also in the um, uh, Black Police Officers Association. What, what do you think... Um, current police officers reaction is likely to be or do you know what it is in relation to the Black Lives Matter movement and and what do you think they may be both white and black officers may be feeling at the moment and reacting how are they reacting to it? Well I haven't seen many reactions that give me a sense of how they feel maybe uh, Alison might be in a better position to do that. But I can only see what's playing out in the streets. And I haven't seen a really positive response of the leadership on the street with the supervision of officers to say, well, actually, we are going to understand and acknowledge what's going on. And there is a movement of change, then we need to be part of that change or we could be a barrier to change. And I'm certain to see and hear the lack of commitment by Commissioner Priscilla Dick. Again, she reluctantly apologised for, for the Bianca Williams video where officers initially, she totally was supportive of. And then she had to apologize at the Greater London Authority meeting. And her comments about institutional racism and how it's unhelpful. Well, 
the institutional racism issue from McPherson was never meant to be a pat on the back. However, it was the opportunity to get moving. It was aspirational. Even the recruitment, retention and progression figures in the Met was there to try and achieve a reflective organisation because that would be a better organisation to serve our country needs. And of course, she has pushed back on any suggestion that the Met Police um, has not progressed. But we just heard the stats. We have seen the footages. And I am not seeing anything of any significance or even a critical mass of officers to say, ah, oh, we acknowledge this. And I'll end by saying this. The real culture of the Met Police and other force areas around the country is actually fueled by the, their federation. And the, the federation nationally and uh, different force areas, not one has actually really made a significant statement of intent. Because we cannot say, anyone cannot say we're not racist. You've got to prove you're not racist. You've got to be proactive and have a statement of intent with the actions. So I don't think I seeing a real acknowledgement strategically and operationally and tactically. And that's where I think a lot needs to be done. The narrative has to be changed from the top right across the organization. Okay, thank you, Leroy. Alison, I don't I want to put you in the position of having to defend the Met, but um, I am interested in your response to both um, the points that Leroy is making and also a question from one of our um, listeners, which is, does the Met still believe that it's institutionally racist? Um, is there anything that the Met can do in response to this? So, um First of all, I mean, the first question that you asked really was around how officers are feeling. Um, me, as a, a, a black police officer within the Met, um, I joined up 19 years ago, actually, to make a difference um, because I wanted to correct injustices as I saw them. Um, and I think there are a lot, uh, if not most, officers um, and staff uh, join policing because they want to make a difference um, and they want to protect people. So I start from that position. Um, one thing that I will say is that uh, there are lots of conversations going on. I can't speak for other forces because um, I'm, I'm in the Met now, but I know within the Met there is strong feeling um, among black and white officers um, about the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. Um, in terms of wanting to correct injustices that happen. Um, and uh, that's something that you would expect within uh, an organisation where people join up to, to want to protect uh, people from, from harm and keep people safe. So I, I, I do start from that position and there are those conversations going on. There's a lot of movement to encourage and to ensure that leaders within the organisation are having those conversations especially with our black colleagues to find out how they're feeling and you will know as well that there are um, a significant amount of officers who have been at the um, the end of assaults and hate crime all sorts of feelings around wanting to protect but also almost some officers um, are you know very very concerned about their own safety and so on and so forth um, the uh, the second point around the uh, institutional racism, I think within any organisation, you are going to get some bad pennies. That is what's going to happen. But I don't believe that the Met is institutionally racist. Um, and um, I've come from Hampshire and I feel the same uh, about that force as well. Um, so that's my position. But I do think that where we find that officers are not... Uh, applying what we would expect in terms of high expectations around the code of ethics and our values, that we should be robust uh, in the way in which we um, which we manage that behaviour, um, robust and fair, and to ensure that we also project out to communities 
what we're doing about things when things don't go right. So I think that things are going in the right direction, but there is more work to do. And were you, Alison, and uh, your colleagues surprised by the um, large scale protests here in the UK in response to what happened in America? And um, do you feel that it was predictable that people would react in that way and how it and, and therefore how the police should respond to it? Yeah, I think I, I don't think there was surprise. I think it was expected when you look at what's happened in the past around different issues globally that, you know, impact um, on uh, UK policing. I don't think there was any surprise to that. And actually, um, it's to be expected that people would feel really, really strongly about what's happened um, because it's a very, very sad circumstance. Um, and it has put a, a different lens on policing, which is welcome. Actually, I think, you know, scrutiny is welcome, especially things that really matter to communities like stop and search and use of force. Um, I know that the Met encourages that scrutiny and would continue to encourage people to make their voices heard. Um, and the other thing that um, is really important to say as well is around protest. Um, it is, a, you know, a democratic right and it's a tradition within policing for us to support um, you know uh, peaceful protest uh, and from that point of view although Covid has complicated the way in which we manage that um, that's to be encouraged and we also you know we always facilitate that. Yes thank you. Rosemary can I bring you in because it does seem to me both what um, uh, Alison was saying and Leroy was saying that um, how uh, communities and the police can work together, um, how the two can uh, resolve matters is a really important part of this. And, and in your role, both as a faith leader and as a, I, I, I guess, a community worker, if I can use that term, um, you've got some experience of this. How, how do you think we can bring the police and communities together better to work on some of these very difficult issues? Thank you. Um, so when I first went to Angel Town, so I'll just start with a little story. I remember our community police officer, his name was Toby, Officer Toby. I always remember him. And as soon as I moved in, he knocked on the door of the vicarage, came around and said, I'm the local community officer. And he knew most of the young lads in the community. He certainly um, went into the school, popped into church, and he was just engaged and involved and he knew people and people knew him. And over the 13 years that I was there, we moved from him and he was moved on as uh, funds were withdrawn and, and um, as belts were tightened in the police and in the community, in the wider structures of society. And then we got police on bikes and we just about knew their name and they rode through and then you know the story. And now we have a community officer, we do have another one. Toby was white, by the way. And now we have a black community officer, but the area that she covers is so wide, she can't get to know folk. She can't get to have a, a real conversation and a real relationship with people because the number of organizations and groups she needs to cover, it's not, it's not possible. So I would say, and I think Leroy was saying this, we need to get back to the basics of building relationships with and between because absolutely, you can't police by force. You can't, um, you can't stop uh, protest. And I just wanted to say to Alison, while I, I, I hear her very much so, I have to say that the perceptions of the community, particularly in areas like Angeltown that I spent so long with and in South London, and listening to those statistics, black people feel that the police treat them differentially. And because they feel they treated differentially, because they know the statistics, because we've been part of seeing the deaths in custody, because we remember Cherry Gross, because we know the incidences that have occurred in, in and around um, London for and the country, but in and around London. And because we've, as an archdeacon, because I had to also think about my sister archdeacon and how her children were treated so abhorrently by the police after their deaths with those images, we feel still that the community, that the police just don't get that relationship and how to build a relationship 
and how to be in, engaged in, in trying to build appropriate and adequate and transparent um, and honest relationships. And I think I would want to say finally that young people, black people, people of color feel that quite often the relationship is one of a power dynamic where they feel not respected where they don't feel that they are listened to. They often feel patronized in the, in the kind of conversations or the relationships. Or when people come to them, when people come to ask, um, how can we communicate with you? How can we do better? It's, it feels like a sticking plaster approach. It feels like you come when there's cri a crisis or there's chaos, and then you come and you say, what can we do now? And then once that moment is over, it's, it's back again until there's another crisis. We need to stop you having these moments of crisis and chaos and then connection. We need to build relationships that are absolutely integral to the community, are lasting. And I just want to say, I said it last night in the webinar, so Alison would have heard it. Young people in Croydon did a listening campaign about what their major issues were. They said their major issue is the relationship or lack of with the police. They would like police um, the police to know them and to call them by their name. They would like to call the police by their name. That, that means that they would like a relationship. And if there has to be stop and search, because they understand that they are victims, as, as Hashi said, they are going to be quite often the victims of, of crime. They would hope that the police would want to be there to protect them as well. So if they have to stop and search, then could they do it in a respectful way and they came up with a, with a saying, which I still want to repeat. They said, can we have stop, relate and search? Stop, relate and search. And if then that way, if, if that's the way it's done, that's the way that people will then have a, a respectful relationship and engagement. So I think the words I want to come out with is the police need some humility when they want to build these relationships. They need to have respect and they need to treat people with dignity. And at the moment, I would say, um, the burning anger in the community is that that is not what's happening at the moment. Thank you, Alison. It's really um, powerful statement um, of, from your perspective and the people that you work with on how they view uh, what's happening to them and what has been happening to them. And we might come back in a few minutes to how we might take that forward um, yeah. collectively. Ashley, can I bring you in at this point? Um, and really interested to hear from you um, as to how um, the uh, the things that Alison was talking uh, that um, Rosemary was talking about um, about how we actively include people who historically and currently feel that they've been excluded from decision making, from power positions, and how we might be able to. Uh, bring uh, some of the change about that Rosemary was talking about, how young people, black, young black men in London in particular, might feel that they're not just on the receiving end, but that they can uh, be supported and uh, enabled to make changes. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think um, if we go back to basic principles, the first principles of policing in, in the United Kingdom Robert, uh, and Robert Peel's idea of community policing and policing by consent, like I mentioned earlier, um, the police in our country and especially in places, big cities like in London, where they are going to be mixing with a big and diverse community, need to always understand that their legitimacy and their authority comes from the relationship they have with their citizens. If the relationship that they have with the people that they're there to ostensibly police, then it, it means that if that relationship is sour, if that relationship is not healthy, then their very authority and their very legitimacy is in question. So that's just basic principles. When we build on that, we obviously have a history over the last 35, 40 years, whether you go through the riots in Brixton, the Sus laws, you go through to uh, Stephen Lawrence, the McPherson report, and all the people that we've heard about, 
dying in police custody disproportionately, and of course the London riots of 2011 and to where we find ourselves today. It's also really important that we acknowledge that there has been progress. I hear what Leroy is mentioning, the fact that we have somebody who looks like Commander Heydari is in of itself a visible and welcome progress in this country that we should first just digest and, and, and acknowledge as a starting point. Now, does it mean that we're out of the woods? Absolutely not. Does it mean that there isn't more work to do? Absolutely not. But sometimes it's always good to look back at the horizon of how far we've come before we then simply just concentrate on this one term that came from the McPherson report, which all too often has become a sort of beating stick on the top of the police. And the police have always flinched at it for obvious reasons. So then let's look at this term institutionally racist. Now, as somebody who sat in the living room of uh, um, uh, McPherson's house in, in Scotland and who actually had the opportunity to ask him, uh, what did you mean by this term? And has it meant what you thought it meant all these years? It was fascinating to hear him because he says, people now talk about the police being institutionally racist, but actually, when I was talking about institutional racism, he said, I wasn't talking just about the police. I was talking about a whole institutional system that went from the police to the part of the political system to the criminal justice system to the way in which things were handled by the media and much much more besides that meant that black a black life wasn't worth what it was and that people weren't putting in as much effort into actually solving that murder as much as one might expect and so then what do we then do about this gap that, that now exists so there's now this really difficult conundrum that we face now, where on the one hand, the communities that are most affected, in my judgment, are communities that rather than being protected by the police, are policed and enforced by the police. So that's a really important distinction. When you have the police, ostensibly they're there to protect you. But it seems as though in the black community, people feel that the police are there to enforce rather than protect. And that's a really important distinction that often is lost on a lot of people without fully appreciating what that means. If the job of the police officers is to protect people, why is it that for somebody like me and for people in our communities, we don't feel protected, we feel enforced against? And that's the difficulty of, of, of where that relationship lies. And I think what uh, Dr. Mallet was talking about earlier in relation to community policing is critical. When I was gr growing up and I challenged uh, uh, you know, Commissioner Dick on this about uh, uh, about community policing, because when I was growing up, community policing was much, much more prevalent. We saw the local community officer walking around, talking to us, mixing and, and, and so on and so forth. Now, a, a lot less. I mean, the statistic that I got from Commissioner Chris, Chris Dick was, was that we have something like 600 uh, uh, officers, uh, community officers in and around schools and communities all around across London. Now, I don't know what those statistics mean in terms of per capita and all the rest of it, but it doesn't feel like the officers are part of the community in some respects. It feels as though a lot of it is heavy handed and it feels as though a lot of it isn't really part of the community. And so bringing all those points together, the history of where we've come from is part of the picture, absolutely. But we have to be careful to not just simply go for this sort of shelf-made statement of institutional racism and dangle it around every time there's a problem without fully appreciating A, how far we've come, but B, how much more there is to do and the police have a lot more to do, but we as a community have to come out and offer solutions.
find a way through all of this and say, this is an answer. It may not be a perfect answer, but here's an answer. And I think that's the mismatch and the conundrum that we're currently facing. And in some ways, it feels as though we're talking past one another. Thanks, Hashi. And, and you reminded me of something that I realised when I went to the IPCC, which I hadn't fully appreciated before I went there, which was that, first of all, the majority of complaints about the police are made, and I think are still made, by middle class white men. Um, because they are the ones who have high expectations of a service from the police. And when they get in, when they are in touch with the police, they often feel let down by how the police react and they feel confident enough to complain about it. Whereas um, the black community feels exactly as you say, they, they experience a force against them, not a police service. And it's interesting, isn't it, that historically we've referred to police forces and police services. Um, so they experience a force and they don't complain because why would they? A, they think it will make no difference. And B, they think if they do complain, it will um, somehow uh, blow back on them. But also it meets, the, it meets the expectations that they had already. Yes, quite. So they're not surprised by how they're policed and they don't feel that complaining will make any difference. And they also worry that actually it might make things worse for them. So there's a whole series of things. So it's an interesting, do you think, um, before I move um, to ask Leroy and Alison in particular to respond to your comments, do you think there are ways that collectively society and police can make amends and make a change for these in these issues because these are issues that we've been discussing for a long time um, and I think you're right there are uh, occasions when we've fallen into relatively lazy um, uh, summaries of the problem but do you, are there thought, are, do you have thoughts about how we could make this better? I mean, I, I mean there are various thoughts that have come to mind I mean I've been following the police forces in Canada and, and, and in Atlanta for example who have come out and I saw that I think it was West Midlands police who who did a a thing where they said they 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 are fully and unreservedly apologized for the historic wrongs that have been done um, by by police officers. I just I, I mean, for me those kind of hollow apologies do us no justice really. What I want to know is is you know, how are you doing something about the disproportionality of stop and search, which is on the one hand very much needed, but on the other hand, isn't some places working? What are you doing more about recruitment in, in, to ensure that you have more representative communities? How, what are you doing about the conscious and unconscious biases that, that exist in the communities that, that the polices are coming forward from? I mean, on the one hand, we can't be constantly blaming the current police force for the historic wrongs but on the other hand they have to take responsibility because they're joining a they're joining a police force that has a legacy you can't just sh sort of shed that legacy that legacy is part of who you are now if you're wearing that uniform you are now part of that long line of people who wore that uniform and that you are inheriting that legacy so you have to be able to own that legacy and not say it's got nothing to do with me i was never a police officer back then so I think on the one hand, the conversations need to be had and we need to have the honest conversations. On the other hand, we have to avoid the kind of hollow statements and the, and the apologies that do no one any real uh, justice. But I finally, I end on, on, on this. And, and I, when, you hear, when you hear back from Leroy and my thoughts, I just wonder what, what, what you might, when Leroy was mentioning about we need more uh, um, fulsome engagement from the police force and a more uh, robust response about what this and I, I wonder if you could elaborate on what that looks like in terms of action so because I think sometimes they don't the police themselves don't know what to do I really believe that I really believe that sometimes you know they don't even know how to react sometimes they're desperately trying to figure out what do we do and then they come out with something nonsensical like let's say sorry and you're just like but to whom are you saying sorry and for what you know it, it's just it's just so i often find that yeah you're right we need to get a better reaction but it's often the case that they don't have a clue 
And maybe that's something that I would love to hear about what we think they could do that could help in some way. Thanks, Hashi. Leroy, can I bring you in um, both to respond to Hashi's uh, comment, but also you yourself mentioned earlier um, the Federation's role, the lack of community policing, and I wonder also whether recruitment to the police, which has over the years, um, try, you know, the police services have tried to recruit more BME um, staff and officers, um, how much you think that matters? I'm just interested in your view of this as someone who's been there, but it, it, you know, is freer to speak in many ways than, than any, a current police officer is. Yeah, um, well, I, I must admit, when I heard Alison talk about bad pennies, um, that surprised me because it, it reminded me of the, the Scarman narrative of the bad apple in the barrel. I think we moved on from that. Um, and it might be useful to find out what she meant by that because it is clear, without a shadow of a doubt, that there are systemic failures in the police, just like other organizations, but it's how you want to deal with it. Now, I would actually say that from the recommendations of McPherson, the CPS responded most robustly, even though it might have been a bit easier because they have a more reflective um, recruitment pool to draw on lawyers to go into the CPS. But Having been involved in monitoring how the Met approached it and the CPS, we saw a more reflective organization. And in fact, the Met was more reflective 15 years ago. Mm. Uh, we had people at Allison's level in chief officer status. We even had a black chief constable, Mike Fuller, an ex-Met officer. And we've never had a black chief constable since. Um, but I won't take it away from um, previous uh, assistant commissioners um, who are equivalent to chief constables, like Neil Basu, who's there at the moment, Pat Gallant, who was there. So, yes. But the in key part of it is still that black officers, and when I say black, I'm talking about people of African, Caribbean and Asian origins, are three to four times more likely to lead the organization in the first two years. And that has not changed because of the hostile environment in which they have to exist. Now, it did improve after McPherson, as I said, the independent oversight to hold chief constables and the commission to account. Because if you take off the pressure, then you'll go back to default. And the default is at the moment, there is less black and minority ethnic officers at chief officer status. In fact, the black officers who are in superintendent ranks, again, are disproportionately subject to discipline inquiries than their white counterparts. So much so that at one stage, six out of seven super chief superintendents in uh, the Met who are black happened to be subject to investigation. I myself was investigated, but then again, I was not expecting anything else because I was keeping the Met under pressure because of what they weren't doing enough with McPherson. But at least in those days, there was something moving. There was that independent oversight. There was that leadership. And I'll, I'll just take the point that, you know, what, what can we say um, about, you know, let's not give the Met a hard time. Well, I give them a hard time because I was part of those ranks and I know they can do better. I know there's nothing wrong in the Met that can't be changed by what's good with the Met. And that's what annoys me because they have sat on their hands on so many things. And, I, and, and it comes from the top. When um, Hogan Howe was the commissioner and he left a few years ago, at least on the issue of institutional racism and the recommendations, he said, it's not for me to say, it's for communities to say, it's for other parties to say, even the government to say. But 
Crusader Dick has decided, no, we're not. It's not helpful. So it's going back retrospectively. And that's what I find painful. At least acknowledge what is going on in our streets. Don't be in denial. Please don't say it's about bad pennies. It is not. It's systemic. And it will not get better unless we do something about it. And one has to be the narrative from the top. Then you need to get a grip of the disproportionalities and start to do something significant. Now, I would like to think the Home Affairs Select Committee that was running before um, the general election into McPherson 20 years on, it stopped for the cause of the general election and of course COVID delayed it as well. I would like to think the Home Affairs Select Committee will look at that because again, Chrisella Dick did not have a glowing report when she gave evidence and she had to backtrack on various things. So I would like to think that we will start put the pressure back on the Met, positive pressure to aspire to achieve a more reflective organization because it's, there's a humane, moral and business case because you're better equipped to deal with the community you serve. And more importantly, as Hashi said, the cornerstone of police legitimacy is trust and confidence. If your officers within your ranks say, yes, I believe in the Met, I'm not subject to disproportionate investigation or civil actions or employment tribunals, then people will join the organization. They'll be in relationship with the organization. And hopefully we'll start to see movement. So get the internal dynamics right, less hostility and and push back on those emboldened officers who think they're unaccountable and, and, and you know, untouchable. They're out there and they're playing with people's lives. And I'll just end by saying, we have got institutional racism by algorithm now. Look at the gangs matrix where young men, mainly some young women are on um, the gangs matrix and some of them don't even know they're on it and they haven't been involved in gangs because of the systemic failures of the criminal intelligence system, which is overlaid by the algorithm, which creates these um, false positives of young people on that matrix database. So that's the here and now. And at no stage did the commission, I've had meetings with her on it, and at no stage did Priscilla Dick say, well, actually, we need, need a root and branch reform because again, there's no independent oversight. There's no way of challenging to get off it. And more importantly, there is no way that people see how people on the margins should be on that database. And, and I would like to think that people start to look at this thing significantly. It got to be acknowledged. If it's not acknowledged, it won't get done. Leroy, thank you. It's really powerful stuff. Alison, um, I don't expect you to speak for the Commissioner, but um, it seems important to give you the opportunity to respond to Leroy's comments and also Hashi's earlier. Thank you. Um, I get the feeling that there are some things uh, that Leroy and I will have to uh, beg to differ on. Um, I think the um, realisation that we have individuals because we take individuals from communities where racism exists, um, that there will be some individuals within any organization uh, who are um, who don't ap apply our values and uh, shouldn't be in the force. I think that's um, a contemporary uh, idea and um, that's uh, that's the way um, I, I see it. Um, really coming back to uh, what both Leroy and Hashi said. Um, for me, this is really about turning on our, what we call our, our listening ears and really listening to communities, having some dialogue, which um, may well be hostile, which I would, ex you know, I'd, I'd understand, but actually um, in going forward in terms of engagement, and I'm looking at our engagement plan uh, across the Met, um, one thing that's really, really important to me is that we start to have some meaningful dialogue and really, really listen and talk 
to uh, communities who are affected by the way in which we use our powers, especially stop and search, to really find out now what is the contemporary discussion around how those communities feel we should be engaging with them, not what are we the, think. Are there mechanisms for doing that, Alison? Are there ways that the moment that yes, either, there are fist or are planned? Yeah, there, so there are mechanisms at the moment, but I think we could do better, and that's part of my role now, that I'm looking at ways in which we can start that. And do you know what? I think much of this is actually quite simple that we have. So I was at a meeting yesterday, uh, Rosemary mentioned that meeting uh, before, uh, earlier on uh, this morning, and that meeting was to bring together faith uh, leaders to talk about ways in which they could help the police talk to communities in a meaningful way. And there was so much that came out of that meeting last night. I've got lots and lots of notes from that and that will form part of the basis of going forward and speaking to, uh, to communities. So I don't think this is, this is not complicated stuff. It's resource intent, intensive and it is about building up relationships, but we've got to start somewhere. So this is how I will be taking things forward. So when Hashi said, you know, what does that look like? It looks like having local conversations with local communities, feeding that back so that those communities are instrumental in forming the engagement plans that we will have going forward across the Metropolitan Police Service. And do you think um, in order to achieve that, the Met also needs, um, and that's a really important statement about out outgoing work and i'll bring rosemary in in a minute on that but is what more does the met need to do internally to tackle the um either bad behavior or the uninformed you know the kind of situation where police officers may handle things insensitively or they may handle things um uh, without enough experience of the communities that they're working with or they may actually be deliberately or in um uh, unpleasantly racist in their behaviour. What more does the Met need to do internally to tackle some of those issues? I think that there are many um, there are many aspects to this. One of them is is around training and making sure that we use our training to the best ability to reinforce our values. We need to make sure that we support leaders so that when they make difficult decisions, we support them and we empower them and we make sure that they have enough information to be able to uh, uh, support their teams to be the best that they can be, but also where they see bad behavior, that they know they'll be supported when, when they um, address that behavior. I feel really strong about mentoring coaching. I think um, Leroy brought up the point about retention within, um, and not only the Met, but in policing in general. There's a lot to be said about mentoring and coaching and being that listening ear and using our staff associations to, to support to support our staff. And it's not to forget that actually the people within policing, whatever colour you are, are from the communities we serve. So ensuring that we really support those police officers and staff within our own organisations so that when they go out, to their communities, they've got something good to say about us. I did note that in all the stuff that uh, Leroy said just now, he did talk about that there are some good things in the Met, and I think that we could do better around our PR, so making sure that communities know what we're doing, that we do have scrutiny that's in place, that our communication is open if they want to come and complain. All of these things, I think, will go some way to building up that relationship, building up uh, the, uh, the the note of procedural justice and legitimacy within policing. We have to be better at telling people that where things have gone wrong, this is what we've done, this is what we're doing right, and that we're willing to listen. Thank you, Alison. Um, Rosemary, do you want to just come in on the point about the sort of relationship between the community uh, or communities and policing and any particular point you want um, to? Okay. So I wanted to say just a couple of things. Um, the conversation about the bad apple in the barrel, I wanted to say that you have to remember that the bad apple is, can affect and infect the whole barrel. So it actually, even if you say it's not systemic or it's not institutional, if you, if you don't attend 
to the rottenness of the of those that are that are deemed rotten, then it can actually then affect the whole structure. So that needs to be remembered as well. So it's not just uh, you know an individual here or there. It yeah. can then um, um, ruin the whole organisation. That's the first thing. And uh, and and in terms of communication, you know the actions of a of, of a very poor officer because of their attitude or their own um, racism can then make a whole determine a whole community's response to the organization as well and and you you know, you know you're only as good as the last thing you did we, we know that so if you have really bad policing in a particular situation it's going to affect the way in which a community um feels and sees about um the the, the police in their area i just wanted to add as well when i first moved into brixton and I'm, i have a young daughter and when we started she would always wave and say hello to the policeman. By the time we were left, we were leaving Brixton, she, like many of the young people in the community, um, didn't feel any affinity to want to have a conversation with the police because she felt that the police were confrontational towards um, young people in the community. So I just wanted to say that's my own personal um, uh, example in my own life. Um, and we also come from the community and we live in it. And, and as priests, uh, particularly, you know, we're embedded in our community. So we, we really feel what are the challenges that people are facing. I wanted to ask that listening is important and deep listening is extremely important, but outcomes, we need outcomes. And what people in, in Angel Town and in Brixton are saying, we're getting tired of com conversations. We're getting tired of consultations. We want to know what actions are gonna come out of this. What difference is, it, is, is going to actually be made on the ground to our lives and to our relationships. So yes, you know, come in and talk, come in and chat, come in and listen. But if that's all we feel that you've just listened to us, but we haven't seen what you want, what is your intention and what outcomes are you going to be planning for? And the only way you can think about the outcomes is if from the very beginning, you start to acknowledge where the problems are. I think it's what Leroy was saying. We need to start with some real open and honest acknowledgement that there are challenges and there are problems. And while there are good things, and it's very important as Hashi says, to talk about the good things, to talk about the things that have happened, but we've still got to set that in the context of a, a very, very difficult and challenging environment. And it is wonderful. I mean, the church is an institution. We stand up and say the church is institutionally racist because we recognize that black people, people of color are differentially treated as priests and as lay people in the organization. What are we doing about it is what is important. I'm absolutely right, hollow, hollow apologies, not worth the paper or, or the words that have been said. What I want to always say to the church and to the police, what is your intent? What outcomes are you planning for? And how can we work together then on that? Because then we can see that you're actually looking down the track and wanting something better to come. Not just that we want to come and listen. And Alison, you'll be very welcome. I'll be happy to work with you, but I still want to know why, you, why you're listening why you want to engage and what outcomes are you hoping to bring about to make that difference? You know, I always say we need to be the change that we want to see. I need to hear the change that you want to be and you want to bring in. And then you can get communities to work with you because then they can actually have some idea of the transparency and the way in which you're going to engage with us. But don't just come to say you're listening. We've had loads of listening. Thanks, Rosemary. Alison, do you, I want to give you just a very quick um, uh, response to that, if you'd like it. And then I'm going to sum up because astonishingly our hour has disappeared. It's a very short time to have such a complex conversation. Alison, did you want to come Thank back? You. Thank you for that, Rosemary. Um, uh, the only thing that I would add to what Rosemary said is that what are the outcomes uh, that communities want? because this is not just about and should not just be about what the police want. My um, thoughts around listening is to find out what the needs of the community are and then we formulate a plan together around what an engagement plan likes, looks like going forward. So for me, this is all about partnership working 
working with communities, faith groups, non-faith groups, whoever wants to, uh, to join in really, to find out what the needs are and for those needs to be really, really clear and then together to formulate a plan around what we're going to do about things. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, I, I'm sorry that I, I, the debate has been so important and the conversation has been so important that we have come to the end of our time. We've taken, I've woven in some of the questions that our listeners have posed, um, but there are many that we've not been able to get to. We'll try and respond to those subsequently. What I'd like to do is thank you all um, for joining us today. Um, and it, this is, as I said, the third of our webinars. The final one is tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. Um, and we'll be reflecting there on the whole range of discussions that we've had in this series, and in particular, thinking about the actions um, and rec any recommendations that we, the Cum Cumberland Lodge, might, might wish to make to the organisations with which we've been having these conversations. Can I just um, very briefly mention that, like all charities, Cumberland Lodge is um, facing difficult financial times at the moment, and normally our programme of events is free to attendees, but our um, lodge can be booked by commercial organisations, private organisations, and that income is what supports our charitable objectives. Obviously, um, for the last three or four months and for the current period, we're unable to run events in the lodge, so our income has disappeared. So if any of you felt able to make a small donation in response to listening in today, we'd be very grateful. And there's a Just Giving page on our website where you can do that. Um, so I'm going to say thank you very much to our um, panel this morning for an amazing uh, set of contributions. It ro raised passions and raised some disagreements, which is uh, the whole point of Cumberland Lodge events. Um, a really good set of discussions so thanks to all of you and thanks to those of you listening and joining in as with previous events this will be available on our website so those of you who wish to share it with colleagues or others please feel able to do so thank you very much thank you